In today's video, we're going to recap Monday's results for the 2020 Stanley Cup playoffs. We have a Rangers prospect signing to discuss, and we're taking a look at some offseason rumors which could impact the futures of guys like Kendrick Lundqvist. Is there an end of an era coming in the Big Apple? Plus, we're looking at P.K. Subban and Montreal Canadiens, Jeff Petrie and Dale Weiss, who apparently could be heading to Europe. We'll discuss all the latest news coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, let's kick things off here with the playoff recap from yesterday. We had some round robin games to determine the top four seeds in the East and Western Conference. And we also had some more qualifying round playoff matchups. So let's kick things off with the round robin games. We had the Tampa Bay Lightning doing battle with the Washington Capitals. The Lightning did come out victorious. It was a very close game. Uh, they won with a 3-2 to two score going to the shootout. Of course, they're using the, the shootout format, which we normally see in the regular season for those round robin games instead of an overtime format since they're not technically considered playoff games. Uh, we also had Victor Hedman return for the Lightning. Stamco still out for Tampa as well. Uh, and John Carlson missing for Washington. Obviously, that's a big loss after he suffered an injury in the exhibition game that the Capitals played against the Hurricanes before this got underway. So certainly some big names they're missing for both teams. It'll be interesting to see what their futures hold here uh, once we get through this tournament because obviously if they're missing when they get to the official first round of the playoffs, that could be big blows here for both teams. So we're certainly considered legitimate contenders to come out of the Eastern Conference. Now we also saw the Vegas Golden Knights doing battle with the Dallas Stars and Vegas pulled away with a 5-3 victory. Dallas got off to a great start early, was up 3-1. Then Vegas came back with three consecutive goals about midway through the third period, about over a five-minute span. Saw goals from Mark Stone, uh, Nate Schmidt as well. Uh, Robin Leonard started in goal instead of Marc-Andre Fleury, which some thought has looked upon as a surprise. I wasn't overly shocked. Peter DeBoer, head coach of the Golden Knights, had made it clear that he likely would play Leonard and Fleury both during their round robin tournament to get both some in-game action uh, and giving uh, Leonard the start for the first game. You know, like I said, some certainly was a surprise to some, not so much for me. Uh, they really need to evaluate things longer term, and I do think there is a possibility that depending on how things go, if Leonard is the main guy in the playoffs here through the whole way, uh, then it could impact the future of both of them longer term. So we'll have to see how things play out. But certainly uh, a bit of a collapse from the Dallas Stars. Said I had a good start, not a great finish. Vegas pulls away with a 5-3 victory after a big third period. They added an empty nether there at the end as well. Now into the qualifying round matchups. We had some more of those going on yesterday. We saw the Carolina Hurricanes go up 2-0 over the New York Rangers uh, on the back of an Andrei Svechnikov hat trick. Svechnikov was a tremendous game for him, having the first hat trick in uh, Canes or Hartford Whaler history. So it was a huge time for him. He was a big part of their, their victory. The Rangers went back to Henrik Lundqvist in goal. Certainly a couple of those goals he probably would have liked to have had back I don't think he really had a bad game per se but we'll discuss Hank here a little bit further uh, in a few minutes time but the Carolina Hurricanes have handled the Rangers quite easily after the Rangers handled them easily in the regular season even without Hamilton and Pesci on the blue line the Carolina Hurricanes are having a real strong forecheck and a really solid defensive play Morazic's been good in goal and the Rangers really have not been able to get a whole lot going here so far the Rangers have yet to have a lead in the two game series uh, having Carolina Carolina lead for the bulk of it or it'd be tied so certainly things need to get better in a hurry for the Rangers I do expect some lineup changes for game three which goes later on this evening Winnipeg Jets battle back to beat the Calgary Flames three to two without Mark Shifley and Patrick Lyon who both suffered uh, some injuries in the previous game both looked to be serious injuries uh, we had some updates indicating Shifley's might have dodged a bullet that it wasn't quite as bad but we really still don't know the full extent of it or how long either player will be out of the lineup but the, the Jets certainly played quite well as a team and really dug deep to get that victory so that series is now all evened up at one apiece we also saw the Montreal Canadiens do battle with the Pittsburgh Penguins last night and it was not a great game from the Habs the Penguins pulled away with a three to one victory uh, for the most part the Penguins outshot the Montreal Canadiens quite badly uh, except the, the Habs didn't have a terrible game on their own end like overall defensive play was was pretty good I thought a lot of stuff in the neutral zone was pretty even um, but they just really couldn't get anything going offensively uh, Crosby scored a goal early on against Carey Price which ended up being a big time part of the difference here uh, Jason 
Jason Zucker on a nice feed from Connor Sheary ended up uh, scoring the second goal and then Konkaniemi got one back for Montreal but at that point it was too little too late followed by the Pens empty netter to seal it up of course we did live stream that game as well uh, so in case you haven't noticed or haven't been a part of any of our streams here there will be plenty more opportunities coming up throughout these 2020 Stanley Cup playoffs where we'll be live streaming and having a chat uh, throughout the whole game stay tuned for updates here as we determine what games we'll be streaming here over the next little while and in the final game of the night, we saw the Blackhawks and the Oilers do battle with the Oilers, evening things up with a 6-3 victory with Connor McDavid uh, getting a hat trick. So he certainly had another phenomenal game. He's been tremendous in the two games in that series so far. Uh, Edmonton's got off to a good start again, and then Chicago stormed back, and I was starting to wonder if it's going to be a repeat of game one, but Edmonton certainly held things together better. Uh, Koskinen started in goal rather than Mike Smith. He said it was, a, it was a pretty good game by McDavid. Overall, the Oilers even things up there. So obviously it was also nice to see the Oilers get some secondary scoring from guys like James Neal, Alex Chase on uh, as well later into the game. So we'll see how that series goes, but it's been a pretty entertaining series so far between the Hawks and the Oilers. As I mentioned as well, we also have a prospect signing quickly to discuss on the New York Rangers. They've signed a 2017 six round draft pick, Morgan Barron, who's six foot four, 220 pounds, originally from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I uh, went to Cornell University where he played three years. The past two years, he's been a point per game or better average over that time frame. So looks to be a pretty decent uh, prospect center iceman here. I mean, like he's a great size, 6'4", 220. I mean, the Rangers are already pretty deep in their prospect pool. So he's going to have a lot of young players to battle and, uh, you know, go up against for roster spot in the short term. But obviously he'll need some seasoning in the minors for sure. Hard to say what this means for his future as well as many other prospects are waiting to find out where they're going to play next year. As we know, the AHL season is going to be delayed until December. So it's certainly going to be a long haul of waiting time for many of these guys to find a place to play. Some are heading to Europe. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But certainly an interesting signing here by the Rangers, a late round draft pick that could turn out to be a pretty solid player down the road. At least he has that potential. Sticking with the Rangers, let's get into some of the offseason rumor talk that I want to take a look at here. Uh, the recent article from Larry Brooks of the New York Post, wondering after that second game, if that could be the end of an era for Hank, the King Henrik Lundqvist. Could he play his last game in a Rangers playoff series? Could he have played his last game as a New York Ranger period it's certainly debatable it's a possibility for sure i mean obviously with the rangers being down two games to nothing to the hurricanes uh, many expect that uh, coach david quinn will certainly have a somewhat of a different looking lineup for game three which goes later on this evening and lungfus is probably not going to be starting at least you wouldn't think i mean if igor sesterkin is healthy enough to play i would imagine he'll get the start and if not there's a pretty good chance they turn to alexander georgiev i mean like it's overall like hank hasn't been terrible uh, but a couple of those goals against the Hurricanes in the last game he probably should have had but you know what you usually can't fault him for all of it but you know they need to make some changes to shake things up get the team in front of them playing better and uh, you know obviously that's one of the easier moves to make as a coach so it's quite possible that he may not start and obviously with all the offseason talk it's quite possible that Lungfus could have played his last game as a New York Ranger with quite a streak on going here 129 consecutive playoff games that he started for the franchise uh, many of us didn't feel he would start game one or two but Igor Shesterkin has not been healthy enough to play and has created an opportunity for the veteran to get back in there and said he'd certainly played better I think in game one than game two uh, could have helped his value a little bit hard to say but certainly hard to say what his future holds obviously he's made comments before that not only does he want to play next year to finish out his contract but he feels he can play beyond that and he's certainly one of the uh, you know more veteran guys around the NHL who's had a really solid career who's yet to win a Stanley Cup and I'm sure that's something that kind of drives him to keep going um, but many feel there's a pretty good chance the Rangers will buy out the remaining year of Hank's contract and he'll be able to move on as a free agent to uh, wherever he can find an opportunity next season if they do that they'll save some cap hit uh, obviously he makes over eight million dollars on the average annual value so that's going to create uh, some much needed flexibility to sign some much needed other restrictive free agents like a ryan strom or a tony d'angelo uh, and they need that flexibility so getting that big cap hit off the books would go a long way to making all that quite more possible and realistic rather than lose some of their younger talents so 
Obviously, like I said, they'll try to trade him before they buy him out. I think that's a given. If they retain up to 50% of his cap hit, that could entice a team to take him on, you know, around four, four and a half million dollars. That might not be too bad for some teams, especially if he can go into maybe a 1A, 1B situation with the right scenario where he can still, you know, try to start more rather than be a dedicated backup. I'm not sure he's going to want to do that because he does have a full no trade. So he's certainly going to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of say over where he does accept a trade to. And if they can't find something that works for him that he'll wait for, then a buyout is quite likely in Lundqvist's days as a Ranger likely come to an end when we hit the offices in here in a couple of months time now i want to take a look at a recent new jersey devils article in the athletic by Corey maziak who was asked about the future of pk suban and whether or not the devils could look to move on from the expensive right shot defenseman of course as we know he's making nine million dollars for two more years uh, last year uh, was his first year with new jersey and things did not go well at all pk had arguably the worst year of his career stats are way down numbers are way down but of course the team as a whole have not really really proven themselves to be all that good so certainly he was a kind of a victim of the team's lack of success as well as his own but i think pk has his own things to work on which he certainly appears to be i know he posts a lot on social media he really seems to be putting a big effort towards building uh, a, a media career for after hockey is done at least that's what it looks like and he's all over the place posting himself everywhere so looks like he's been training quite hard trying to get himself in uh, in great shape for next year but it could be you know a long haul here before pk gets back on the ice but in this article he was asked about the fact was the does it make sense that they would trade him and he really doesn't feel that that's a likely scenario given the fact that his value would be quite low and he, where he is making nine million dollars there wouldn't be a whole lot of teams really knocking on the door to get pk suban but at the same time i can't help but wonder that if the devils were to do a salary retention then obviously you know, at that point, you take P.K. Subban at $4.5 million. If he can rebound and play anywhere close to what he did previously in his career during his time in Nashville and Montreal, then you can't help but wonder if a team would be able to take that on. Obviously, New Jersey might have to add some sweeteners to the pie here if they want him to take the full cap hit. I mean, I know when New Jersey picked him up from Nashville, the only reason they took the full cap hit is because they had so much cap flexibility, where now, because of the flat salary cap, many teams aren't going to have that luxury, and it's going to be very difficult to do. So, obviously, with P.K. Subban's contract being so expensive, it is going to make things more limited, and it does decrease the odds of a trade. But with New Jersey having, you know, not a ton of cap problems like most teams, it also doesn't really make things urgent for him to be moved on from either. They need some veterans there. Uh, obviously, you know, the contract for them isn't as much of a problem as it would be for many other teams. But I would say myself, I think they will likely explore the possibility uh, to see about doing a trade with some retention. If they can give his ice time to a younger player to develop more, I think to a degree that makes sense. But at the same time, it's going to be tricky to do. So I fully suspect the odds are PK will be back in New Jersey to complete this contract. And then once he's a free agent, I guess it's hard to say what his future holds at that point. A lot of that's going to depend on how he plays this year and next before we get to that point. Now, lastly here, I want to take a look at some Montreal Canadiens information. Obviously, a couple of articles here. Uh, one from The Athletic and Pierre Lebrun looking at Jeff Petrie's future in Montreal. Now, of course, he goes on to write in this recent Athletic article about how he's really grown to appreciate Petrie's game, how he spends a lot of time covering the Hams through their regional broadcasts, and obviously Petrie sometimes does you know, not get a lot of uh, admiration from a lot of other national media if they don't get a chance to watch him play a lot, but he is very consistent, very valuable defenseman to Montreal. He is 32 years old. He is, has still has another year left on his contract, and there was a lot of talk leading to the trade deadline that the Habs were getting some inquiries and that Mark Bergevin but should really consider trading him, uh, obviously due to the fact that he was getting up there in, in years a little bit, and they had a lot of young defensemen knocking on the door that many felt they would move Petrie on and start to give more of a bigger role nice time to some of their younger defensemen. But Pierre Lebrun now thinks that, obviously, Bergevin values him so much, which is why they never came close to trading him at the deadline, and that he fully expects Petrie to be extended before next season starts between November and December. Lebrun says he did some digging around to find out if there's been any talk so far about an extension, and right now it looks as though everything's on hold until they reach their official offseason. And what he's heard, he fully suspects an extension to be done before next season gets underway. I mean, that's 
pretty big news. So even though Petrie himself may not be moved, you can't help but wonder if that's going to lead to other moves on the blue line. Obviously, with Petrie being 32, difficult to say how long they extend them for. But if they look at extending him even two, three years, and then you get Shea Weber, who still has a lot of term in his contract. He's a couple years older than Petrie. So that gives you two veteran guys on the right side who are at this point in their career still playing relatively well, relatively consistent. Um, but that's going to create a log jam for many of their other guys trying to move up higher into the lineup. Of course, on the left side, you got guys like Ben Sherratt, you got Brent Kulak, you get Romanov coming into the picture next year as well. Uh, they're going to be looking for likely third pair type of minutes. You get Victor Mente, you've got Noah Juleson, you get Xavier Ouellette, who's a restricted free agent coming up as well. You've also got Kiel Fleury. So there's a bit of a log jam there on that left side, uh, and obviously some of them are, like, are going to have to play more on their offside. But still, like that's a lot of younger defensemen that could get blocked out by having a lot of these veteran guys here stick around longer term. Now, in the case of Weber, he's the captain. He's got a longer term contract. I do understand why Petrie would be valued to Montreal and why they want to hang on to him. But at the same time, if he stays, who else is going to go? Because these guys, the other guys, are not going to get the playing time that they're looking for. So while there's been a lot of talk about the Montreal Canadiens having many changes, including some upgraded help on the blue line, it looks as though that Jeff Petrie may not be one to go to see those changes take place. So let me know your thoughts. Who else? What other changes do we see on the Canadiens blue line? Some of these younger guys are going to end up getting boxed out, so who stays and who goes longer term? Now, as the another part of the Montreal Canadiens discussion here, I want to take a look at Dale Weiss. There was reports that as soon as his season wrapped up with Montreal, whenever that comes to an end in this play-in series, if they were to lose against Pittsburgh or whenever they're beaten out of this uh, 2014 format, that he'd be heading over to Switzerland that he's looking at taking, I believe it was a two- or three-year contract in the Swiss League. Now, Weiss was recently asked about this, and he denied it, saying there was no deal in place and that his desire was to stay in the NHL next year, and he was hoping to sign another contract with the Montreal Canadian. So, of course, while you're with one team, I don't really expect a player to come out and admit that he's looking at other options. That's something that you always have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I do think the odds of Weiss getting re-signed by Montreal are pretty slim. They have a lot of forwards. Some younger guys going to be looking for more of an opportunity. And I just don't see a guy like Weiss, who mostly plays fourth line duty, really being worth being kept around. But as much as he would probably prefer to stay in Montreal and in, in the NHL, I just don't see it being a likely scenario that plays out. Uh, there was reports that seemed to be from pretty credible sources before saying he was offered a multi-year deal in Switzerland. And to be honest, I think it's in his best interest to probably take that. You're probably going to see some other NHL veteran guys that are going to end up getting boxed out maybe a little bit earlier and younger than they were hoping for with the flat salary cap and everything that's been agreed to in this new CBA. You're going to have to have teams taking on even more entry-level contracts to balance things out, which is going to push out some veteran guys in that middle level uh, since they're gonna just not going to have the room for them. You're going to have your top level guys making lots of money and then your bottom six guys are going to be getting less and less and they're going to need more entry level deals to ba balance that all out and like I said some of your third and fourth line bottom six guys are going to probably end up going to Europe or having to find work elsewhere because they're just going to get cut out with the cap not going up any higher. Otherwise, they'd give them more of an opportunity and let their younger talent develop a little bit longer into the minors. But things are going to be changing in this new NHL with a new flat cap and new CBA. So let me know your thoughts on everything discussed here today down in the comments and we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing, turning on your notifications so you don't miss any future content. We'll be posting daily and there's going to be plenty more live streams coming soon throughout the 2020 playoffs. So stay tuned for those. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye.